Good evening, Harrisville Baptist Church. Church family, we're so glad to get to come to you for our weekly prayer meeting. It is middle of the week, and uh, it's been a busy week. Lots of things going on, lots of things happening with families in our church and with individuals and all kinds of opportunities. And, uh, of course, school starting back and so many great things that are happening with students, but also so many uncertain things that are happening. So lots to pray about. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer together as we get started, and then we'll take a look at, at uh, those that are on our prayer list. Got some new updates and some additions today. So let's pray together. Lord God, we love you this evening, Father, and we thank you, Lord, that you love us. Lord, it's only through your love for us that we even know what love is, to be able to experience it given to us, and Father, to learn how to give it to others and to show it for you. So, Lord God, thank you for loving us and helping us and teaching us to love you as well. We do love you, Lord, and we thank you, Father, that we can trust you with the concerns of our hearts. And God, even now, as we, as we speak about those who are on our prayer list, would you be working in their lives? And as we come to you, uh, wherever we are, together through technology and through the time that we spend praying together, Lord, would you help us to, to pray your will for each and every situation and each and every person that we'll pray for this evening and always. God, that's what we want. We want your will. So, Lord, even as we talk about our, the folks on our prayer list, would you uh, let us do so in an attitude of prayer? Father, we know that you are holding each of them in your hands. And, Lord, we ask that you would, uh, you would help them as only you can. We trust you to do so. And, Lord, we thank you that we can come together and do this tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, this evening you see there's a, there's a few changes, a, a few things coming on, uh, going on, and a few that, that aren't bolded, but we do have some updates for you. So uh, the first one we want to lift up is Miss Michelle Davis. Uh, she's uh, someone in our community here that, uh, that is a friend of Angela Neely's, and, and many others of you probably know her as well. Uh, she's had some surgery lately and, and uh, is recovering from that. And it looks like they've, uh, she's gone back to the hospital. She's back there again dealing with some of the aftermath of this surgery. So pray for Michelle and for her family as well. And, uh, and, and pray that the Lord would help uh, speed up the recovery and uh, let the recovery go very smoothly from this, uh, this, this surgery. Uh, smoother than it's going right now because she's having some complications there. Uh, we do have some good news about Miss Bobby Godby. She's still in the hospital, but she is steadily improving, uh, doing well. So continue to pray for Miss Bobby. Uh, thank you so much for praying for her so much, as some of our others that, that we've been praying for for quite a while uh, that we continue to lift up daily. But Miss Bobby is doing a little bit better, still in the hospital, uh, but in, a, in much better shape than she has been. So the treatment is working, and she's recovering uh, from COVID there. Um, a big day today for uh, for Miss Jean and Miss Judy. Uh, first off, with Miss Judy, the the idea is that they're going to be able to send her home. Um, not sure if that's happened as of right now during our broadcast just yet, uh, but uh, but praying that that will happen in God's timing and in the right timing for Miss Judy for her to be able to get out of the hospital and get away from that confusion. But also thankful for the treatment that she's been able to receive while she's been there, and then pray for her recovery at home and uh, being able to get up and get around and, and working with the physical therapists as well as the home health folks. Uh, praying for them as they help Miss Judy get back to uh, to a little bit closer to her normal life. Uh, Miss Jean, today we're, we're so excited. She is out of the hospital. She has not been. She's not come home, uh, but she has gone to Wisteria Gardens um, Nursing Care Center, and so she's there in Pearl. And uh, we're so thankful that she was able to get in there, and uh, also that she was able to get out of the hospital. Pray for Miss Jean as she adjusts to the new place. Of course, that's taxing and and, and on our body when we make a move like that, especially in the shape that Miss Jean has been in. Uh, but we're so thankful that uh, that she was able to go there and that she'll be moving forward in her recovery there at Wisteria Gardens. And uh, looking forward to uh, to seeing and hearing great news for both of those sweet ladies as we continue to pray for them. Uh, I want to remind you, uh, uh, or not remind you, some of you already know, so it'll be a reminder. Some of you, you might have just now heard. Uh, but pray for the family of Rod, Rodney Herndon. Uh, Rodney was a, uh, was a worker and a serviceman with Blossom and Gas, and uh, he, he passed away in, in an accident there um, dealing with his work. So pray for his family, that God would provide for them, and uh, that he would be healing them and helping them in their time of grief and their time of loss. Um, Mr. J.P. Deer, we talked about him, but, uh, but somehow uh, we, we missed, uh, mis misplaced him on the prayer list, but he's back on there. He is at home. Uh, the update for, the, for Mr. J.P. today is, is that uh, the, the arm is not quite healing as, as quickly as they'd like, but they're going to give it a little more time before they move on to a, a different possible procedure to help stimulate that healing in his arm. So he's, uh, he's got a long road ahead of him, as we know. Uh, this is another uh, step that maybe is, uh, is maybe a, a, just a slower part of the process. So we want to pray for Mr. J.P. and for Miss Betty 
and for Eric and Karen and for Chet and, and, uh, and for the whole family there. Also, not on our prayer list, but we will be adding her uh, as, as we get more news about her. But, uh, but Chet, dear, Eric's brother, Mr. JP and Miss Betty's son, um, his wife is, is uh, having some health issues as well. So we want to lift her up um, as we lift up Mr. JP and that whole family. We love the deer so much and want to, uh, want to see God continue to work in mercy and in, and in healing in their lives. Uh, I got a chance today to talk with uh, Mr. Robert Muirhead. Uh, many of you know Miss Carolyn Muirhead. Uh, she's visited quite a bit and been a part of a lot of things going on in our church over the last year or so. Uh, Mr. Robert, right before the end of June, uh, was having some heart surgery, and uh, thankfully he got some very good news there. It didn't have to be as extensive of a surgery as he thought, so his heart is doing much better. Thankful for that, and uh, he sounds great. Uh, still got some other surgeries that are going to be coming up for him, but we'll let you know how to pray. Right now, just thank, thank the Lord that Mr. Robert's doing okay and didn't have to have that major heart surgery. Um, also remember Marley Neely, got to see Marley today. Uh, she's back in school and she's got a buddy that's helping her while she's in her cast to be able to get her backpack on and get it, uh, get to class and, and, and do the things she needs to do. But she's doing really well. And, and I'll tell you, she's tough. Uh, she's been herself all the way through this, at least that I've seen. Uh, I think I'd have probably been a little grumpy, but she, she seemed to be doing really, really well. So uh, continue to pray for Marley as she uh, goes through the school process. Uh, and also pray for all of our students, teachers, and staff of our schools. We've been praying for them these last several weeks as they get started. Uh, it's a scary time. It's a weird time. Some of the kids like it better this way. Uh, many of them don't. Uh, some of the parents like it better this way. Many of them don't. Uh, but pray for all of these families of students, teachers, and staff, and the students, teachers, and staff themselves uh, as they go through school here uh, in such a strange, strange time. Um, we want to continue to pray for those in our nursing homes. Uh, Miss Carolyn Addy and Miss Amy Bridges uh, are ones we, we used to get to visit before COVID hit uh, so very much. And, uh, but pray for all of those folks, uh, as well as those that are taking care of them in the rest homes there in that section of our prayer list. Um, one addition to the cancer section there is Mr. Carl Foster. This is Miss Judy Foster's husband, uh, Ken Barlow's brother-in-law. So uh, we want to pray for Mr. Carl as he is dealing with cancer himself. And uh, we lift up him to the Lord to be healed of it, first and foremost, if that be the Lord's will. And if not, then that he would be treat his treatment would go well and would be effective and that he would be um, made not to suffer physically in, a, in and all this and pray for the family as well. A couple of things there in the prayer and missions there at the bottom, uh, things that are always there on our prayer list, but sometimes we don't uh, take time to mention them. I know many of us are praying for each of these areas, but a few things just to, to give you some specifics and how to pray for some of these uh, areas here. Uh, first off, our deacon ministry. We're so thankful to be able to serve with great men, uh, men who, who love the Lord and who love this church and who love the people that are this church as well as the community that we get to minister to. Uh, I can tell you just as a, as a pastor, it's, it's been amazing to work with this group of deacons, uh, actually the two different groups of deacons uh, that we've had, but, but mostly in our time here as pastor at Harrisville, it's been this group of deacons. And so uh, we've, we've asked them to give us another two months uh, added to their term, and that, that's not a, a thing that we ask lightly because it is a, a lot of ministry, a lot of things going on for them as deacons. Uh, but they are working, we are working towards getting our deacon nomination process, figuring that out in a time when we're not meeting together and able to vote right there in person. Uh, but we will be working on that here in our September deacons meeting. But pray for the men, um, first off, that are rotating off, that, uh, that, that we're thankful to God for them and their service. But also pray for the men that God will be rising up. And, uh, and I feel like, I, I don't know for sure, but we've got several men that this will be the first time uh, that they're eligible, that, they're, that, that maybe the guy might be calling them up to serve serve as deacons. So pray for them and pray for that whole process that we'll be going through here in the next uh, next few weeks as we uh, as we figure out that way to do that uh, in, a, in a time when we're meeting remotely. Uh, also, pray for our youth and our children's ministry. Uh, we're excited here. Lord willing, we've got a couple of meetings set up for this Sunday and the next to, to talk about what youth and children's ministry will look like in the coming days, weeks, months and even years as, uh, as, the, as the Lord leads us to make the changes that we have to make uh, because of COVID and because of the situation that we're in and the meeting restrictions and things like that, uh, but, but trying to find out the best way, according to the Lord, to, to minister to our, our youth and our children. We've got great folks that work with youth and children in so many different ways, from Sunday school to Wednesday nights and Sunday nights and special events, and we're so thankful for them. Uh, so, uh, but pray for those ministries here in our church and in our community as well. 
What about you this evening? Those are uh, the updates that we have off of our prayer list, so we want to uh, lift those up, but we also want to lift up what is on your heart. So take just a few seconds here, and if you've got somebody that we miss, some situation that we miss, something that has uh, just, uh, just come about and we don't know about it yet, let us know. You can put it right here in the comments. Okay, wherever you are, let's take a chance to, to take just a couple minutes here and pray for these requests that we've mentioned. Maybe there's some that we didn't mention, uh, and you need to pray for them as, uh, in addition to what we pray for. Go ahead, take a few minutes, and let's pray together. Lord God, you are wonderful, you are amazing, and God, you are far better than we deserve, and you love us. And, and Father, that is far more than we could ever begin to have earned and certainly deserve. So Lord God, we thank you, that Father, that you show your concern and your love for each of us. God, we ask you to, to show your love as, as only you can in the lives of the people that we've mentioned tonight and so many more that we haven't. Lord God, we ask, Father, for healing for those who are sick, if that be your will. Father, if it be your will that they not be healed in that way, then, Father, we pray for great treatment and good know-how and, and, and good following of the, of the diagnosis and the prescriptions that are given to them. Father God, we ask, Lord, that you would work in the lives of those who are sick. Help us to minister well, whether they're in our family, in our church family, or in the family that is the Harrisville community. Father God, for the, the, the educators and the healthcare workers that are working so hard in all of their regular things that they do and that they and the regular sacrifices they make that, that are just made more by all the regular or all the new sacrifices that are beyond regular in the time of covid father we found, we just ask lord that that they are found to be blessed protected strengthened and grown in you and father that even through this you would bring educators healthcare workers students parents that you bring them to new faith in jesus christ lord god work as only you can Father, we thank you for, our, for the word that you give us and our time that we have together tonight to study a little bit of it. Father, help us to, uh, to grow tonight, uh, no matter where we may be watching this service. Father, help us to grow in you, in our faith in you, in our trust in you, in our obedience in you. Lord, we love you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Well, this evening we, uh, we're thinking back to uh, where we were on Sunday morning starting the Back to School series. And uh, we, we, each week of that we'll have one lesson that we, we probably learned in school in some way or another uh, that definitely has its root in Scripture. But we learn how to live that out in our school ages, probably from very young ages. Uh, but that we maybe need a refresher on. Maybe we need a, a, an encouragement. Maybe we need a little shot in the arm, so to speak, to help us to live those out now as adults or even still as students. If that's who we are. Uh, and so we talked about the, this past Sunday, loving our neighbor. We talked about the parable that Jesus taught of the Good Samaritan teaching us who a neighbor is and what a neighbor does. And uh, that, that idea, that, that, that phrase, that commandment of loving our neighbor as ourselves is not simply something that is just a summary in the New Testament. Of course, we see that when Jesus is asked about uh, what the greatest commandment is, he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And he also says in the second one is like the first, love your neighbor as yourself. And so we know that those go hand in hand and he uses them to sum them up. But that command to love your neighbor and even to love your neighbor as, you, as yourself, that wasn't something that Jesus coined in that moment when he talked about that as a summary of the Old Testament law. Rather, it's something that is contained in the Old Testament law. And so we looked back a little bit uh, this week in, into some of the places where we see that. And one of them stands out because of the chapter that it comes out of. And of course, it comes out of the book of Leviticus when the law is being explained and its many various facets and its many various uh, commandments and expectations from the Lord to us. And, uh, and, and we see in, Le in Leviticus chapter 19, there's a lot of laws that make us go, okay, well, that makes sense. But some of them make us go, what in the world? Why is that a law of God? Why is that so important? And so this evening, we're just going to take a few minutes tonight to, uh, to, to go through uh, a few laws from Leviticus chapter 19. We're going to bounce around and skip a few verses. It's a, it's a very long chapter uh, of God's Word that teaches us a lot about what He has to uh, expect from us and what He commands from us in being holy in Him. Uh, but the thing to remember about the law, and we, re we see this in the New Testament, and, and of course that's the time in which we live is when we have the New Testament. Uh, and the New Testament explains to us how the law is fulfilled in Christ and how in Christ we can find our salvation and our righteousness. Not by having to follow the law, but by giving ourselves over to the completion, the fulfillment of the law, who is Jesus Christ, and putting our trust in him, not, on letters, uh, not into letters on a page. And so the book of Leviticus is full of, as well as parts of Exodus and going back into Deuteronomy and uh, we, the, all the places where we read the law of God, it is there for a purpose. It's not necessarily in any way a checklist. It's not something where we're sitting here and every day we have a checklist of 600 plus laws that are part of the law of God that we're supposed to say, okay, I did that today. I didn't do that today. That's not the point. The point of the law, especially as we see in the book of Romans, is, is, is to point out how holy God is. There's so many laws, and so many laws that seem common sense worthy for us, but also that seem very strange to us, even so many thousands of years later after they were first put on, uh, on record and given from God to his people. They're, they're, all those laws were there to point out how holy God is and how futile it is for us to try to be holy like he is on our own. So we pick up and we're going to look at Leviticus chapter 19. Again, we're going to bounce around. We're going to start off with verse 1, uh, and then I'll let you know as we go. So if you're following along in your copy of the Word, uh, just listen out and you'll know which verse we're moving to. If not, they'll be right here on your screen. So in Leviticus chapter 19, beginning with verse 1, we read, The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the entire assembly of Israel and say to them, Be holy, because I, the Lord your God, am holy. Each of you must respect your mother and father, and you must observe my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. We skip down from verse 3 to verse 9, and we read, When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner. I am the Lord your God. Do not steal, do not lie, do not deceive one another. Do not swear falsely by my name and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. We skip down to verse 14. Do not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block in front of the blind, but fear your God. I am the Lord. 
Do not pervert justice. Do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great, but judge your neighbor fairly. Do not go about spreading slander among your people. Do not do anything that endangers your neighbor's life. I am the Lord. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Keep my decrees. Do not mate different kinds of animals. Do not plant your field with two kinds of seed. Do not wear clothing woven of two kinds of material. We skip down to verse 23. When you enter the land and plant any kind of fruit tree, regard its fruit as forbidden. For three years you are considerate forbidden. It must not be eaten. In the fourth year, all its fruit will be holy, an offering of praise to the Lord. But in the fifth year, you may eat its fruit. In this way, your harvest will be increased. I am the Lord, your God. We skip down to verse 28. Do not cut your bodies for the dead or put tattoo marks on yourselves. I am the Lord. Do not degrade your daughter by making her a prostitute, or the land will turn to prostitution and be filled with wickedness. Skipping down to verse 35. Do not use dishonest standards when measuring length, weight, or quantity. Use honest scales and honest weights, an honest ephah and an honest hen. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. So we see quite a bit of, uh, of as is titled in, in this, this chapter in my Bible, in my copy of God's Word, we see um, various laws. He's talking about a lot of things here that are part of the law of God. And, and many things are repeats. Again, the idea of loving your neighbor is, is repeated in here uh, as it is in other places. And as, as Jesus uses in teaching about loving your neighbor in, in light of the parable of the Good Samaritan. Um, it's interesting to me that as I read these laws, even in some of the ones that may seem a little strange, a little different, or maybe a lot different than how you and I as 21st century Americans would go about doing life, uh, or even if we're old school, you know, 20th century Americans, how we, would, how we came up and, and, and learned how to do life, um, even, even in the way that we follow the Lord. Um, and so as we read this, though, it's interesting to me that in so many of them, um, there is a, a provision for the neighbor. There's these, these laws, not every one of them, but so many of them speak specifically for God taking care of other people through his people. And of course, the law deals with going into the promised land and living out um, how that's going to be. And that's where the law was given to the people, was on their way to, uh, to, to go into the promised land. That was their hope. We know that as we've been reading in Hebrews, that, uh, that, that the first generation that heard the law didn't make it into the promised land because of their disobedience. They didn't obey what God had given them in some very simple terms. And so therefore, they didn't even have a shot at obeying him in all of these detailed ways. Uh, but they were heading into the promised land. This is God teaching them how to live out their faith. God's giving them this promised land. God's giving them this gift, and he's telling them how to live. He's gifted them as his people. Now, how do they live as his people, and how do they measure up? How do they show their faith and their reverence to him? And so let's get into it and just take a look at these, these various laws that we've, that we've read about this evening. First off, in chapter 19, verse 1, uh, it says, The Lord said to Moses, and that's a, that's a common a, in introduction to chapters within the book of Leviticus, and it's just a reminder that this didn't come from men writing this down, and this wasn't Moses saying, well, I think this will be good. This will help us out. This will be good for governing our people. This will be a good way to show it. This is all from the Lord. Moses is a prophet in that he is speaking from the Lord to the people. And that's something to always remember, especially when we go through some things that today seem silly. Well, this is something that came. Each of these are things that came from the Lord. He says in verse 2, reminding us of, and, and reminding us as we read it now of Moses' prophecy in the Lord, but also uh, telling Moses what to do. He says, speak to the entire assembly of Israel and say to them, be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. Now, what he's saying to them is impossible on their own. That what he's saying to them, though, is the goal that he has given them, the command that he has given them. Being holy as he is holy is just as much a command as anything that he says in the specifics of the rest of this chapter or in any part of his expectation, any part of his law. And what we find out is, is though we can't do that. 
It's not that we don't need to try. It's not that we don't need to commit ourselves to the Lord to follow these laws. It's that this law points out our limited uh, you know, nature, our, 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 our problem with being able to follow th all this through. But God does expect from us, and when it comes to our judgment, when it comes to that, he expects holiness. We know in light of the New Testament, in the light of the teachings of Christ and the life that he lived, we know that, that we can only be able to meet up to his expectations by putting our faith in him, by submitting our lives to him in every way. But this is, as he's explaining this, this is showing how much he has expected of his people. Why? Because he himself, the Lord himself is holy. He is the one uh, who is, is the pinnacle, is the standard. And he's saying, measure up to this. And he's showing us that we can't and therefore laying the groundwork for us responding to the gospel in Jesus. In verse three, he says, each of you must respect your mother and father and you must observe my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. Um, here we have something that is, is, is a, a throwback, a, a repeating, um, a, an emphasis upon parts of the Ten Commandments, uh, as we will see also in some other parts of this chapter. Uh, there's some rep repetition going on there for, uh, for emphasis' sake. Uh, but, but again, we notice that in these various laws, the first thing is to honor our father and mother. Uh, that's not something that is taken lightly and something that so often sadly now and for so long has been taken lightly. In fact, it was taken lightly in this time and that's why he had to tell them that you need to make sure that you take and honor your father and your mother, that you respect them, that you live in a way that respects them. It teaches us how to live in a way that shows respect to the Lord, but it also teaches us thankfulness for the people who God has used to bring us into this world and for the relationships as important as they are. He says, as a part of verse three, he says, and you must observe my Sabbath. So reminding that, that these things are important and he's, he's just putting those back in there to emphasize how important they are. As we skip down to, uh, to chapter 19, verse nine, it says, when you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your garden. Do not reap to the very edges uh, of your field or don't gather the gleanings of your harvest. He goes on in verse 10 to say, Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and for the foreigner. I am the Lord your God. Now, we see here a provision that God is putting in his expectations and his commands to his people that take care of those who are not his people, that take care of those who don't have their faith in him. And so here we see God's heart to minister to and to protect and to provide for even the people who don't put their faith in him. This is something where it says, hey, don't, do not take every little bit for yourself, but be generous. And so the way that God set this up was, he said, don't, don't take everything to the very edges of your field. Well, it makes sense that if there's a foreigner that's going to be provided for, that they would first encounter the edges of any field they came to. And so there they would be able to find help in their time of travel or in their time of hardship. And also, he says, don't go back over the vineyard a second time. Now, how many of us are guilty of the things that we have, the things that we are stewards of, we want to use every little bit for us, and we want to suck the, the, the absolute marrow out of the things that we have for us and see what we can do. We do it with our dollars. We do it with our thoughts. We do it with our, with our actions and our attitudes. But here God is saying, leave margin. Leave a portion for those who... Through us, God is calling us and providing for us to help. God's bringing the increase, and so he says part of this increase is purposefully to provide for those who weren't a part of planting it, who weren't a part of reaping it and harvesting it, but who God is caring for nonetheless. Kind of interesting uh, that, that, you know, as, as he sadly gets the, the reputation to be this, uh, this Old Testament hateful God that only cared about the people of Israel, well, that's not true. He cares for everyone. And even through his people, he, he brings blessings to those who are outside of his people. Still the same thing in Christianity today. We need to make sure that we're not using everything that God has given us just simply for us, but that we're being generous in our tithe and in our offerings and the way that we serve and the things that we do, that we would help uh, be a part of God's provision for others. God doesn't ha need us to do this. He could provide for them in other ways, but he chooses to include us. And that's amazing to me and to, and to us as followers of Christ. We also, we, uh, we read there in the next verse, in verse 11, again, some repetition from the Ten Commandments. Do not steal, do not lie, do not deceive one another. 
Uh, these are the ones where when we think about God's law, these are things that we think, oh, well, yeah, those are the things I need not do. I mean, these are the things I need to make sure I don't steal. I need to be honest, not lie, don't deceive one another. So this speaks to honesty, um, and it's part of loving our neighbor, right? It's, it, it falls into that. You can't love your neighbor and steal from him at the same time or lie to him or deceive them. It doesn't work that way. Love is honest. Love is pure. Love is holy, and, and that's the type of love that we're called to have. Um, now, this is a good contrast between verses 9 and 10 about the field and providing for the foreigner. Uh, that's something that we don't usually do on our own. That's something that we don't think of. We want to be efficient and we want to make sure that we're getting a huge return on our investment and a huge yield from our crops. And so we want to pick up every little thing. He's saying something that doesn't quite make sense. And then he follows it right back up with something that most of us, uh, if we know anything about God, we would say, okay, well, that makes sense. Verse 11, those three things, that, that certainly lines up with what we know about God. But it's interesting that he's adding that in and reminding us of those things that we already know, but also teaching us some things, even as we read them in 2020, that seem different to us. Uh, we go on and read verse 12. He says, do not swear falsely, again, dealing with honesty, but now dealing not with so much each other, but something that we might say in each other that in fact, in fact in, impacts our relationship with him. So he says, do not swear falsely by my name and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Uh, this is the idea of taking his name in vain. And, and the idea there is, is that we would have such reverence for even the name of God, for even being able to say God. Uh, for a Hebrew person, uh, it was something that they would never say uh, his name specifically, but when they talked about him, it was very important how they talked about him and how they evoked uh, even talking about God himself. And it's important for us to do that too, that we would have such reverence, such awe, such fear of God uh, in a holy and, and, and respective sense that we wouldn't allow his name to be dirtied by throwing it into things that don't matter or things that, that have bad attitudes behind them. That's why when we get the idea of, of saying certain words when it comes to God, when it says to even saying the name of Jesus, we don't need to say that lightly. And that's, this is one of these various laws that he points out to us um, in, in verse 12 here in chapter 19. We skip, a, skip over a verse and we come down into verse 14 and it says, Do not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block in front of the blind, but fear your God, I am the Lord. Here is loving your neighbor and loving those who are at a disadvantage because of their physical uh, uh, handicaps or their physical limitations. Uh, we're going to be talking about here in, uh, in, in week three of, of the Back to School series, we're going to talk about honoring the weak and talking about in Romans chapter 14 what that looks like. Uh, but this is, this is, again, providing for the one who is limited, providing for the one who does not have the use of all of their faculties, providing for the one who very much in this situation and in, in, in not in a time of inclusion in culture, they would have been thought of as less than. And many people would have thought that they sinned and that's why they were blind or, or deaf. But he's saying here, don't put a stumbling block in front of them. Don't, don't curse the deaf. In other words, he's telling us um, to make sure that we're taking care of others. And notice he uses... Um, uh, imagery and words that, that match their, 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 um, their limitation. He says, don't curse, don't, don't speak badly to the deaf. In other words, don't try to get away with it. Don't put a stumbling block in front of the blind, but instead protect those people. He goes on to say, do not pervert justice in verse 15. Do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great, but judge your neighbor fairly. Now he's going to talk about here in, uh, in, in some verses to come about scales and, and being honest. He's already said, do not steal, do not lie, do not deceive. So all of this is, is something that we're being told so that we can work in honesty. Well, and the reason for that is because God doesn't deceive. God doesn't cheat. And all of his law is telling us how to live in a way that is righteous before him. And that goes back into the futility of it, because on our own, we can't keep up with all this stuff. We we're going to fall in places, and some more than others. But, but here he's telling us that his judgment is impartial. He doesn't look at how much money someone has or how much stature they have and, and judge them more favorably than the one who doesn't have enough. But by the same token, he doesn't look at the one who doesn't have enough and say that they're better than the one who does. But rather, he judges fairly and honesty, not honestly, in holiness and in righteousness. Verse 16, you read, do not go about spreading slander among your people. Do not put, do anything that endangers your neighbor's life. I am the Lord. He says this, and, and, and I believe these two are linked, not just because they're in the verse number, the same verse together, but because they're linked in, in caring for 
your neighbor and loving your neighbor. First, don't go about spreading slander about them. Speak truth or don't speak at all. And that's a biblical concept. That's not just me speaking out of frustration. Uh, it is true, but I got to be careful how I say that and make sure I'm saying it in love. Speak truth or don't speak at all. If it's something you heard that somebody else heard that somebody else heard and on down the line or something you saw on Facebook that maybe was right or something you, you, know, you, you think you might know, but you don't really know, speak truth or don't speak anything at all. And even when you know something that's bad, don't speak it to others. Don't speak slander. You know, slander can be true or false um, when it comes to the biblical description of it. He says, don't do that. Provide for them by loving them and love them by speaking well or not at all of someone. And he goes on to say, do not do anything that endangers their life. Um, you know, many times we think, well, hey, I didn't, I didn't kill them. Well, sometimes we do kill their character. Sometimes we kill their trust. Sometimes we kill their reputation. Sometimes we kill their opportunity to be able to be thought well of in their other relationships. And so it endangers their life in another way. It doesn't maybe endanger their physical life, although God would prohibit that too. Sometimes it endangers more than that and their lives in different ways. We skip down to verse 18 and he says, Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. And here we have verbatim this love your neighbor as yourself quote. He says, I am the Lord. Uh, he goes on in verse 19 to say, Keep my decrees. Do not mate different kinds of animals. Do not plant your field with two kinds of seed. Do not wear clothing woven of two kinds of material. Uh, this shirt's a stretch. I think I probably got a little, you know, a little cotton polyester blend going on here. Does that mean that I'm sinning? Uh, does that mean, oh, I can't believe that you're talking about the word of God and wearing this shirt? Well, again, remember that the law has been completed in Christ. We're actually going to talk about, uh, freedoms later on in the back to school series in week four. Uh, but we're also going to talk about some things uh, as we continue to move forward, uh, in, in, in how, Christ has, has completed this, and so he, he is, he's brought this law to fulfillment, and therefore, I don't have to worry about whether I'm wearing a cotton polyester blend. What he's talking about right here is reminding the people of the purpose that they live for. The purpose they live for is to glorify God as his people. We also have that as Christians here today. We, if we are Christ's, we are Christ's. And so if we're following him, then we have to make sure that we do what he says in the way that he calls us to be different from the people around us. There are so many things, and, and, and maybe this may be one of the most important things that we'll talk about tonight. There are so many things when we compare ourselves to our neighbors and our neighbors to ourselves. There are so many things that we read like this in scripture that we want to say, oh, well, they're doing this. This is bad. But understand the context. It's not that God's law doesn't apply, but it's been fulfilled. And the context with which we're reading it here in Leviticus, this is people coming into, God's people coming into this promised land and trying to remain holy and devoted and unique to him. And so the whole idea here about not having two animals mate together, about not planting your field with two different types of seeds, about not having uh, two fabrics woven together of different material, it was this overarching idea that we're not going to mix this God and following him, the one who's blessed us with this promised land with all these other gods. It was about remaining pure. And so it was about not mixing them and making them uh, therefore impure, but instead keeping things separate, keeping things holy. It doesn't remove them from the people they're around. God's still providing for those neighbors in there and still expecting them to take care of the foreigner, the one that's not of their household, uh, as we talked about a few minutes ago, but not giving up their identity in the Lord. And so that's where a lot of this, uh, a lot of people talk about interracial marriage. Interracial marriage has nothing to do with skin color. It has to do with this thought that is here. And so it's not that, that, that we just do whatever we want, but it's we make sure we understand. That's one of the reasons we're reading in, 19, in, in, Lex, excuse me, in Leviticus 19, chapter 19. Uh, it's just make sure that we understand where God's law is coming from and what it means to us today. He says, uh, in, <laughs> as we skip down to verse 23, he says, When you enter the land and plant any kind of fruit tree, regard its fruit as forbidden. Another way of translating this is uncircumcised. In other words, unclean. In other words, you couldn't, you couldn't use it, you couldn't handle it, you couldn't do those things because it was forbidden. Forbidden fruit is something we're, under, we're familiar with from the Garden of Eden. He says, regard its fruit as forbidden. For three years, you are to consider it forbidden. It must not be eaten. In the fourth year, 
all its fruit will be holy, an offering of praise to the Lord. So four full years of this new fruit tree. First three years, it's unclean, it's forbidden, it's unholy, and it has implications to your right, your ritual cleanliness. Um, you're not to do it. It would be sin to eat from those first three years of these new fruit trees that are planted in the promised land. The fourth year, you still don't eat it because it's to be sacrificed to the Lord. Verse 25, we see, but in the fifth year, you may eat its fruit. In this way, your harvest will be increased. I am the Lord your God. Now, this is one of those that doesn't make a whole lot of sense at first because we read it and say, wait a minute, if I plant a fruit tree, I'm looking for fruit. And I'm looking for fruit more than likely to, to eat, to, to have in my family and to feed my family. So what in the world am I doing planting a fruit tree and having to wait till five years later? It's fifth year, four full years, and then however long it takes to bear fruit again. Why am I having to wait this long? Well, think about this for just a second. It's a new fruit tree in the promised land. God is saying that if you do this, your, your harvest will be increased. This is about faith in the Lord. This is about taking these new things that God is bringing in and making sure that he is the one who's being trusted in it, not just their agriculture or horticultural uh, expertise. So what we see here is, is this is a sacrifice being made to follow the Lord um, and, and therefore to eventually come into his blessings, to eventually come into his abundance we have to sacrifice first. Well, folks, this is right here at present in the gospel. We have to give up our life to find eternal life. We have to submit to be exalted. We have to, to give our life to Christ so that we can receive from him the life that he and only he can give us in forgiveness and in grace. Now, to me and you, you know, we, we took a venture into planting a couple of tomato plants this year. Man, just as soon as we could eat a tomato off of there, we were ready to eat a tomato. And uh, had I had to wait five years, man, that'd have been tough. But this was simply just for the, for the new fruit trees that they planted uh, when they entered the land. Um, and, and so it wasn't that God was telling them to do without fruit for five years. But he was saying, follow me in the way that I set this up. Now, again, these are things that, that on our own we're going to fall in. And, and we have fallen in and, and we're going to sin in. And they sinned in as well. But we see which one of these laws that doesn't really maybe make sense immediately to us until we understand where it's coming from. Verses 28 and 29, we read, Do not cut your bodies for the dead or put tattoo marks on yourselves. I am the Lord. Well, right here, this one gets quoted a lot when, you know, when, when I don't want my kids to get a tattoo. Um, I'm not a fan of tattoos. I'm not, I, I'm tattooless, <laughs> right? I don't have a good enough body uh, or, or, you know, look good enough to, to make a tattoo look good anyway. Um, but this is one that gets quoted. And remember, this is for a reason. You see, what they entered into in the promised land was a, a culture, a group of people, many groups of people who practiced this in their religion. And so this is, again, one of those things that we still deal with today. We're not talking about going into tattoo parlors and getting, a, you know, uh, you know your, your newest tattoo or whatever you're trying to get. What he's talking about here is there was ritual celebration of tattoos. Uh, there was ritual celebration worshiping pagan gods that would involve cutting yourself for the dead and marking your body. And God is saying, no, have no part in that. That is not what I'm calling you to. I'm calling you to what I've called you to, not to what all is going on around you. Now, for you, uh, whether or not a tattoo is sinful, I'm going to let you and the Lord decide that. But make sure that if, if and when you are deciding that or helping somebody else decide that, that you don't just say, well, here it is. Leviticus 19 uh, says, uh, do not do it. Well, there's, there's a little bit more to it than that. Make sure that we understand that. And that's one of those, you know, we may, some of you might hear that law and be like, why is that a problem? Man, that's no big deal. I mean, I, I love my tattoos or I love the tattoos of other people. Um, certainly in the fulfillment of the law in Christ, whether someone has a tattoo or doesn't have a tattoo is not supposed to be a judgment of who they are. Uh, again, going back to what we've read tonight, we've got to make sure that in our judgment of each other, uh, that, we are, that we are seeing each other in, and doing so without partiality. Marking on skin, not many people are cutting themselves for the dead these days, but the whole idea behind this is making sure we understand that the context here is to not practice what other religions are practicing, but to stay holy unto the Lord. Verse 29 says, and, and this is, uh, is going to be one that you go, well, yeah, that makes sense. 
Uh, do not degrade your daughter by making her a prostitute, or the land will turn to prostitution and be filled with wickedness. Um, I've got two daughters, and uh, let me tell you what I'm not going to make them if I have any, <laughs> any say so over it whatsoever. Uh, I'm going to raise them not to, to, to believe that this is a good thing and, and, and to stay far away from it. But the thing here is, is don't start it, and you won't have it. Don't, don't let your family take part in it, and you'll be further away from it happening more and more in their culture and in the promised land and in their lives. Uh, last two verses this evening, verses 35 and 36, says, Do not use dishonest standards when measuring length, weight, or quantity. Use honest scales and honest weights, an honest ephah and an honest hen. Ephah being a, a relatively large dry measurement unit and a hen being a, a measure of, of liquid measurement. Uh, but he says, make sure that your standards are, are honest, that they're fair, that they're right, because that is who God is. He says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Again, he's calling us to a life that, uh, that, that on the surface, what he's calling us to may not make sense. In fact, as, as the New Testament tells us, that the, the preaching of the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing. Uh, a lot of these laws that we read in verse 19 and so many, or chapter 19, and many others in the book of Leviticus, especially now around election time, are going to be batted about as biblical support for why someone's on this side of the issue or that side of the issue. But we've got to understand the context because God wasn't on any of these sides of the issue. God was on his side of the issue. And if we're following him, that's where we want to be as well. And of course, his way is going to be honest. It's going to be fair. It's going to be right. It's going to be holy. It's going to be loving and it's going to be providing and showing mercy for our neighbors. Just something interesting, uh, you know, as we look through God's Word, there's so many things. Uh, I know that I, even after years and years, uh, well more than half my life at this point of studying Scripture and being in classes and, and, and reading about them and, and, and doing all kinds of things and teaching them and serving uh, the Lord in His Scriptures, there's so many things that, that are so very interesting to me, and hopefully they're interesting to you too. These were just some of those laws, and we could have pointed out many more, but there's just some of those laws that... that make sense and some that maybe don't make sense until we do dig a little deeper. Now, I'm no, I'm no scholar in the law. and I'm no expert in the law as the, as the one who asked Jesus about who his neighbor was that we talked about Sunday morning. Uh, I don't profess to be, and so this is a very basic understanding, but hopefully it's something that helps you think about it. And, and maybe if, if you hear someone use one of these laws, make sure it's in context. If it's not, don't blow them up. Don't hit them over the head with your biggest study Bible. No, just, just understand that there's more to it than that. And just as there's so much more to God than we understand, there's more to his word as well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this evening. Father God, we do thank you for your word. We thank you that it teaches us first and foremost, as we heard repeated over and over again in chapter 19 of Leviticus, you are the Lord. You are the Lord our God. God, help us to understand what that means and what you mean as we give our life to you in Jesus Christ. God, for those who haven't done so yet, would you bring them to a point where they would put their faith in Christ and Lord, those who are coming to Christ, we celebrate you for. For those of us who know you, Father, help us to know your word and to know the context of it. We love you, Lord. <coughs> In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Folks, we, uh, we love you as well, and we hope that you have a great rest of the week. We're praying for you. Let us know how we can help you. Our office is back open. We open back up this week, uh, so if you need to come in, uh, we do ask that you wear a mask and that you practice social distancing and you wash your hand and do all those things, hopefully, that you're doing wherever you're going. Uh, but our office is open. I know some of you still use the mail slot. You're welcome to do that, but we'd love to see you as well. Uh, I know Angela would. If I'm not here, she'd love to see you just to have somebody else around. So we, uh, we're here for you. Let us know. Continue to pray for those that we prayed for and let us know about people who uh, their situations are arising uh, that we can pray for as well. God bless you and have a great rest of the week.